Greetings everybody, Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is going to be a, uh, hopefully a quick Bible study. Uh, it's not, I don't really consider it that important, but somebody recently asked me about this and I thought, well, I'll just do a quick Bible study on it. Was there a local or a global flood in the days of Noah? And like I say, it's not really, I, it's, it is absolutely not an essential doctrine. I mean, whether you believe it was global or local, it doesn't really matter. You know, what matters is, to me is uh, the virgin birth of God incarnated into the flesh, living a sinless life, was crucified, dead, buried, and rose again on the third day. That's the essential part, my opinion. That to me is the gospel of Christ leading a sinless life and dying for our sins, paying the price that we couldn't pay. Global flood, eh, not really, you know, it's not, like I say, it's not an essential doctrine. I wouldn't never, I would never disfellowship somebody for that, you know. But uh, my opinion is it was global. And one of the reasons, and I'm going to show you from the Bible soon, but, you know, if the flood was local, why why build an ark? Just tell Noah, oh, hey, Noah, you're going to have to walk, you know, a couple hundred miles with your family or, you know, 600 miles or whatever, you know. What do they take, 120 years building the ark, I think it was, if memory serves me correctly. But it was over, it was a long time, long, long time that they were building the ark. I mean, how far could you travel in, you know, a hundred years. All right, I heard it was 120 years, but the Bible doesn't specifically say that. Uh, it was just some commentators' opinions from Genesis 6 and verse 3, but the Bible doesn't say how long it took Noah to build the, the ark. So maybe it was 100 years, maybe it was 20, maybe it was 50, but, you know, let's face it, if the ark, I mean, if the, if the flood was uh, local, Noah could have just moved. You know, that's kind of how I look at it. So, but, you know, let's take a look at a few things. And then we'll uh, figure something out here. All right, well, let's take a look at something. Um. There's another point I want to make, too. Excuse me there. Um, some people theorize that there it was a canopy of water above the earth. And it would help filter out radiation. Thus, people wouldn't get skin cancer and um, as much. And uh, that could account, possibly, that's a theory, of why people lived you know, longer lives back then. 600 years was not that uncommon. I think Methuselah lived, what, uh, like 900 and something years? You know. So let's take a look at Second Peter verse 3. I'm sorry, Second Peter chapter 3, verse 1. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you in both which I stir up your pure, pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. There's holy prophets, and then there's unholy prophets. Keep that in mind. And of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers. Oh yeah, we're here. Walking after their own lusts. Yep, and I was one of them when I was in my 20s. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? 
For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the evolution. No, the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old and of the earth. Listen carefully. And the earth standing out of the water and in the water. What does it mean, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water? Does that mean um, there was water on the ground and above the ground? You know, like clouds? I don't know. That's kind of how I look at it. Whereby the word a uh, world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Some Bible scholars have done um, genealogy uh, and looking at, uh, I think, if I remember correctly, 40 years as a generation. And they've come up with the idea that the earth, according to Bible genealogies, is about 6,000 years old. Now, isn't there, didn't the Lord create everything on six days and rest on the seventh? On the seventh day, you know, the seventh day Sabbath. Well, if a day with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day, we're getting close to the end of the sixth day and the seventh day would be the Lord's Sabbath. Isn't there a thousand year reign of Christ where Satan is uh, thrown into the bottomless pit and locked up for a thousand years? Oh yeah. Think about that. Uh, let's take a look at that real quick. All right, let's take a look at Revelation chapter 20. I know I'm skipping around a little bit, but, you know. Okay, Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Now, this is a good angel. Verse 2. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the drag, uh, the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. It's funny, I've had people tell me the devil and Satan is two different beings. Well, guess what? No, they're not, if you believe the Bible. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. Um, here's the Bob theory. I've mentioned this before, but we'll mention it again. What happens to all the children that died in childbirth, the aborted kids, those that died before the age of accountability? Won't, won't they be given a chance to grow up and without Satan and have people that uh, believers in Christ raise them? And then after the thousand years are expired... Uh, Satan gets loosed for a while. How long? We don't know. But then he gets to uh, try and test these people and see if he can get them to follow Satan or if they want to follow the Lord. Now remember, there's going to be Ezekiel's temple in the Millennial Kingdom. Now if Christ was the ultimate sacrifice, what's the purpose of the temple in Ezekiel? Well, 
without going into it, I mean, you can do a little YouTube search, you know, type in Ezekiel's temple. I mean, that's obviously during the millennial kingdom reign. But I think that uh, the people that were aborted as children, they're going to have a choice. Well, do I want to do animal sacrifices at Ezekiel's temple? Or do I want to believe in the blood of Jesus? That's kind of my theory. Uh, we'll see when it happens. All right, so... Uh, so, Satan's going to be bound for a thousand years, and then after that, he's going to be loose for a little season, and then uh, he's going to ga gather some people, make an army, and then they're going to come against Jerusalem, and then fire's going to come down from the sky and wipe them out. How do I know that? I've read the book, <laughs> and I didn't cheat. Matter of fact, when I first came to the back to the Lord... Um, I opened up at Genesis 1-1 and didn't stop until I got to Revelation chapter 22. Uh, so that's kind of how I look at it. All right, let's go take a look. All right, right now I'm doing the canopy thing. Uh, let's go to Psalms chapter 104, 104, Psalms 104. Verse 1, Bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty, who covereth thyself with light as with a garment. You know what? That's kind of how I think Adam and Eve were prior to the fall. I think they were clothed with light just like God. I mean, let's face it. Adam was created in the Lord, in the image of the Lord. Why wouldn't he have been covered with, you know, light? And then uh, after they fell, the sin in the garden, um, oh, gee, we're naked. We got to have clothes. Let's get some fig leaves here. Yeah. What happened with the transfiguration of Jesus? Huh? What happened? Well, when uh, Moses went up into the mountains, um, well, the mountain, uh, Sinai, to get the uh, Ten Commandments, the tablets, the stone, and he came down in Exodus 34, 35 it says and the children of Israel saw the face of Moses that the skin of Moses's face shone it was shining people and Moses put the veil upon his face again until he went in to speak with them boy that'd be a scary thing huh a face like a light bulb woo -hoo. all right in Mark chapter 9 and verse 2 and after six days Hmm, six days, huh? Six days, and what happens on the seventh day, the, the um, Sabbath, right? And after six days, Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John, and leadeth them up into an high mountain, just like Moses, right? Apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. Matthew 17, 2, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun and his face did shine as the sun and his raiment was white as the light interesting huh i like well i think so all right let's go back to psalms 104 verse 2 well let's read the whole thing verse 1 bless the lord O my soul O Lord my God, thou art very great, thou art clothed with honor and majesty, who coverest thyself with light as with a garment, who stretcheth out the heavens like a curtain, who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters, 
who maketh the clouds his chariot, who walketh upon the wings of the wind. Verse 4. Who maketh his angels spirits, his ministers a flaming fire. Who laid the foundations of the earth, that it should not be removed forever. Hmm. You know, there's some people that believe that the earth stands still and the heavens revolve around the earth. And you know what? If that's true, and it wouldn't surprise me if it is, uh, that would absolutely prove God's existence, in my opinion. So, instead they have us hurtling through space. I don't know. Verse 6. All five. Who laid the foundations of the earth that it should not be removed forever? So they're talking about the earth. Verse 6. Thou coverest, coverest it with the deep as with a garment. Listen carefully. The waters stood above the mountains. The waters stood above the mountains. The water stood above the mountains? What? How do waters stand above the mountains? Verse 7. At thy rebuke they fled. At the voice of thy thunder they hasted away. They go up by the mountains, they go down by the valleys unto the place which thou hast founded for them. Thou hast set a bound that they may not pass over, that they turn not again to cover the earth. He sendeth the springs into the valleys which run among the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild asses quenched their thirst. By them shall the fowls of the heaven have their habitation, which sing among the branches. Huh. I wonder, you know, is this talking about water in the sky? I don't know. Could be. Maybe I'm reading something into it. I don't know. Uh, all right, let's go to Psalms 136. I guess we'll start more at verse 1. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. O oh, give thanks unto the God of gods, for his mercy endureth forever. O oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endureth forever. To him who alone doeth great wonders, for his mercy endureth forever. To him that by wisdom made the heavens. For his mercy endureth forever. Boy, that's a good thing for us, huh? That his mercy endures forever. Verse 5. To him that by wisdom made the heavens, for his mercy endureth forever. forever. To him that stretched out the earth above the waters, for his mercy endureth forever. To him that made great lights, for his mercy endureth forever. The sun to rule by day, for his mercy endureth forever. The moon and the stars to rule by night, for his mercy endureth forever. To him that smote Egypt in their firstborn, for his mercy endureth forever. And of course, they're talking about Israel. And brought out Israel from among them, for his mercy endureth forever. With a strong hand and with a stretched out arm, for his mercy endureth forever. To him which divided the Red Sea into parts, for his mercy endureth forever. And made Israel to pass through the midst of it, for his mercy endureth forever. Now there's people, I'll tell you, the King James Bible's mistranslated. 
Moses, Israel didn't go through the Red Sea. They went through the Sea of Reeds, which is not the Red Sea. And uh, the Sea of Reeds, they say, is only ankle deep. That's how they were able to cross. But then how did Pharaoh and his army drown in ankle deep water? You know, this is the kind of nonsense that comes out of Bible colleges nowadays. Or should I say, um, Yahuda eyesed. Uh, verse 15, but overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea, for his mercy endureth forever. To him which led his people through the wilderness, for his mercy endureth forever. To him which smote great kings, for his mercy endureth forever. And slew famous kings, for his mercy endureth forever. Sihon, king of the Amorites, for his mercy endureth forever. And gave their land for an heritage, for his mercy endureth forever. For an er heritage unto Israel his servant, for his mercy endureth forever. Who remembered us in our low estate, for his mercy endureth forever. And hath redeemed us from our enemies, for his mercy endureth forever. Wow, did you know God's people had enemies? Why, if you listen to the churches, God loves everybody. He doesn't have any enemies. I mean, God wants everybody to get saved. There's even churches that teach that Satan gets saved in the end. Yeah, well... They call themselves churches. I call them something different, but hey, that's just me. Verse 25, Who giveth food for all flesh, for his mercy endureth forever. O give thanks unto the God of heaven, for his mercy endureth forever. All right, now, let's take a look at Job 37. All right, let's take a look at Job 37. And uh, verse 1. At this also my heart trembled and is moved out of his place. Hear attentively the noise of his voice and the sound that goeth out of his mouth. He directeth it under the whole heaven and is lightning unto the ends of the earth. After it a voice roareth, he thundereth with the voice of his excellency, and he will not stay them when his voice is heard. God thundereth marvelously with his voice. Great things doeth he, for we cannot comprehend. For he saith to the snow, Be thou on the earth, likewise to the small rain, and to the great rain of his strength. He sealeth up the hand of every man, that all men may know his work. Then the beasts go into dens and remain in their places. Out of the south cometh the whirlwind, and cold out of the north. Huh. You know, <laughs> it's funny. The cold does come out of the north. Where, where does all, uh, all those uh, winter storms come from? They come from the Arctic, right? They always come from the north. And the whirlwinds, where do the um, hurricanes come from? They come from the equator, the tropics, the south. Um, unless, of course, you live like in Australia, you know. But uh, we're talking Israel. Uh, so, you know, it's funny how... <laughs> yeah, you didn't know the Bible had meteorology in there, did you? I'll be honest with you, I didn't either until I read this. You know, it's funny, I've read this and listened to it numerous times. And every time I read the Bible or do a Bible study, it seems like I find something new that I didn't know before. Verse 10. By the breath of God, God, frost is given, and the breath of the water, and the breath of the waters is straightened. And by watering, he weareth, wearieth the thick cloud; he scattereth his bright cloud. 
and it is turned round about by his counsels that they may do whatsoever he command, commandeth them upon the face of the world in the earth. He causeth it to come, whether for correction or for his land, or for mercy. So I guess whirlwinds come for correction, for the land, or for the mercy, right? Hearken unto this, O Job, stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. Dost thou know when God disposed them? and cause the light of his cloud to shine? Dost thou know the balancing of the clouds, the wondrous works of him which is perfect in knowledge? How thy garments are warm when he quieteth the earth by the south wind. Listen to this carefully. Verse 18. Is this the water canopy? Now, people... Uh, scholars that I respect and admire that have probably forgotten more than I'll ever know say that Job is the oldest book in the Bible and I, I tend to agree with them. I have no reason to doubt it. For years I thought Job, I mean uh, uh, Genesis was older than Job but this kind of a verse makes me change my mind. So let's read Job 37 and verse 18. Hast thou with him spread out the sky, which is strong, and as a molten looking glass? Did you catch that? Hast thou with him spread out the sky, which is strong, and as a molten looking glass. Why would they say that? Is there a canopy of water above the earth that it looks like a, a, looking, a looking glass, a molten looking glass? Now, and what is glass? Do you know glass is basically sand that's melted in crystal form? Uh, I mean, diamonds are a crystal. Diamonds are carbon. The same thing is, you know, you put charcoal on the grill, or those of you that have coal, uh, still have coal, that's carbon. When you burn wood, what's left? The, 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 bar, the black stuff, that's carbon. But when it's crystallized, which means that all its atoms are aligned, instead of being black, it becomes transparent. And a diamond is a transparent crystal of carbon. And glass is sand, silica sand, that's been melt melted, crystallized. It's clear, right? Unless you put, you know, stuff in it to, to give it a color. But why is he saying this? Hast thou with him spread out the sky? So it's talking about the sky, which is strong and as a molten looking glass. Why are they talking about a, a, a glass in the sky? Why are they talking about that? Are they talking about a water canopy? I mean... That's the only thing that I can think of that it actually makes sense. And if you had a canopy of water, uh, you know, one of the reasons the desert gets so hot and so cold, you know, the deserts are wild. During the day, they can get to be 120 degrees. And then at night, it freezes. But when you got water, uh, humidity, it sort of evens out the temperatures. But the deserts lack that. So they're extremely hot during the day and then they get cold at night. I mean, really cold. They can get cold at night. I mean, not freezing, but I mean, you know, there's a huge temperature swing. Uh, I remember one time I was in Colorado and uh, it was like 
85 during the day, and then it got below freezing at night. So that was like a 50-degree temperature swing. Of course, I was at 10,000 feet near tree line. That was like July 4th weekend. I remember that. Went up into the mountains to do some camping and work and stuff. And it was, it was, oh man, my water froze at night. It was cold. I mean, it was cold. I had a sleeping bag and two thick blankets and I was freezing at night. Like five o'clock in the morning. But if you had a lot of water up in the sky, it would regulate the temperatures. You know what? They have found in Siberia a herd of, like, I think it was deer, with their heads above the water, frozen. So here it is. These deer were swimming in the water, and they were frozen before they got from one side to the other. They have found woolly mammoths with flower petals undigested in their stomach. They have found flower remains and trees in northern Siberia in the Arctic Circle. Something drastic happened and happened quickly. For those animals to have frozen and to have flower petals in their stomachs and weren't even digested, you know, and they found uh, flowers and, and, and trees um, in the Arctic. I mean, can you imagine that? I mean, you're talking even colder than Alaska and Canada. I mean, Siberia is, is cold, people. I couldn't imagine. So the flood, you know, before the flood, the world was totally different than it was after the flood. All right, so let's take a look at Genesis chapter 6. Um, you know, and, and that's the thing. If the flood was like local, why would the lifespans of everybody go from being hundreds of years to just 120? All right, let's read Genesis chapter 6. I guess we'll read all 6 and 7. May as well make this a, a real Bible study. I was planning on doing this quick one, but... Eh. All right, Genesis 6 and verse 1. Now, if you don't know who the sons of God are, may I suggest you read Job 38. Uh, the sons of God and the stars shouted for joy at the creation of the earth. Okay? Well, I'm sorry, but Adam wasn't created until six days after the earth was created. When you read the, uh, the creation account of Genesis, days 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, the angels are never mentioned as having been created on any of those days. Logically, Let's use some uh, Mr. Spock Vulcan logic here for all you Trekkies. And no, I don't like that. He was one of the tribe. But um, logically, the angels existed prior to the earth. So they had to have been created sometime before that. But let's face it. The Bible is not the book of the angels. The Bible is the book of Adam. Period. The Bible is not about Satan. Satan's mentioned. You know, your family history. If you had a book on your family history and, you know, I used to come over to your house, you know, maybe at uh, Thanksgiving and, you know, greet you guys, you'd, you might mention, oh yeah, Bob came over and, you know, we had dinner uh, Thanksgiving. But, your family history book would not be about me. It's about your family. Well, the Bible's the book of Adam. Angels are mentioned, but nowhere in the creation does it mention the day that God created the angels because 
but yet they shouted for joy at the foundation of the earth in Job 38. So they had to have existed prior to the earth being formed and created. So therefore, the sons of God in Job 38 that shouted for joy at the creation of the earth had to be angels. It's inescapable. I, I just don't get why people just don't see it. They, I don't know. All right. With that in mind, Genesis 6, verse 1. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair. Fair. You know what? Um, what was Snow White? What did the wicked witch or what, the wicked queen say? Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all? And then the mirror said, oh, that's Snow White. Snow White. The word fair there is a racial description, people. And the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. You see, before that, people were living hundreds of years. Hundreds. Something changed. And there were giants in the earth in those days. Oh, yeah. Unbelievers, un unbelieving women marry believing men, and then they have giants for children. That's what uh, the modern demon nominational Bible cemeteries teach today. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Hercules, Thor, Zeus. Any of those names ring a bell? Odin. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was, heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, oh, because believers are marrying unbelieving, um, um, believing men are marrying unbelieving women, I'm going to wipe out the entire earth. Uh, I don't think so. No, the fallen angels wanted to pollute mankind. Read Ezra chapter 9 about the holy seed mingling themselves with the people of the land, the Canaanites. People, please. I mean, you know, this stuff is not rocket science. I mean, if, if I can understand this, it's not rocket science, okay? I by no means am I a Bible scholar. I'm just some guy that's read the Bible a couple of times. You know, and I don't have it all figured out, but I mean, some of, you know, going to Bible cemetery is a waste of time. Get on your hands and knees, read James chapter 1, and ask the Lord, beg the Lord for understanding. It's not that hard. It's really not. You know, turn your TV off. That's what I did many years ago. I never really liked television. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually and it repented the Lord that he made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. And there's a heresy going around that says that... Uh, Man repenting is the same thing as when God repents. Uh, no, it doesn't. When you hear a heretic tell you that, tell that devil to go to hell. Because God is a sinless, exalted, 
uncreated being. We are sinful created beings. We should repent of our evil and wickedness. When God repents, it means he's sorry. He's sorry that things got so bad here. But we need to repent of our wickedness. Uh, it, it's either in Revelation chapter 2 or Revelation chapter 3, I forget. But you can read the chapters on your own. Jesus told a believing church to repent. And there's a famous preacher, internet preacher in Tempe, Arizona, that teaches that repentance just means to change your mind from unbelief to believing. You don't have to repent of your sin. Just believe. Well, so in Revelation chapter 2, or is it verse th or chapter 3, Jesus told a believing church to repent of their unbelief. Jesus told a believing church to repent of their unbelief. Really? No. He's told them to repent and do the first works. To repent of their wicked deeds and do the right thing. Believe me, John the Baptist, the greatest a uh, prophet that ever was born a woman, according to Jesus, said to repent. Jesus said to repent. God doesn't have sin to repent of. We do. I, I ask the Lord to forgive me for my evil everything, every day. I mean, just Jesus said, just to look upon a woman with lust in your heart is sin. Yeah, ladies, I know that doesn't apply to you, but... You know, and don't tell me women don't lust. Uh, I worked for an electronics firm down in uh, Boca. We had a guy that was a big, tall, good-looking guy who worked. Uh, he was drafted in the NFL. He actually he played in the football league. He was drafted, and uh, I think he played for Detroit Lions, if I remember correctly. Big, big, strong guy. He was. He told me he was cut in the last cut. They can only keep so many players on a team. He was cut by the last cut. Nobody else picked him up. So he never had an NFL career, but he played football in college. And um, all the married women at the place, when he'd walk into the room, their mouths would drop, their tongues would hang out. I mean, not just the married girl. I mean, the single ones, too. But, I mean, you know, I was trying to hit on the, some of the girls, and they wouldn't, you know, they weren't interested in me. Of course, I was nothing much to look at. But, uh, but boy, when he'd walk into the room, oh, I was jealous. Uh, matter of fact, uh, he was always showing me all these $20 bills that he was getting for tips. He worked weekends at a... Uh, like a river cruise where they would do dinner and drinks and all the girls would write their phone numbers and names on $20 bills and throw it in his tip jar. And uh, he told me he made more money. He made more money working the weekends on the cruise than he did working all week at the electronics firm. And I believe him. So, you know, sin is sin, people. You know, and just to... to Check out a good-looking woman and go, whew. Jesus said we'd committed adultery with her already in our heart. So he didn't just, he raised the bar. He showed us our need for the blood of Jesus. And uh, yeah, so, all right, back to Genesis 6. I know I got carried away there. Verse 7. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing and the fowls of the earth. For it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace, grace in the eyes of the Lord. Yeah, I've heard people say, oh, there, there was only law and wrath and punishment and judgment in the Old Testament. And that's not true, people. 
There's grace in the Old Testament. Verse 8, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. What's the first four letters of that word? Gene, G-E-N-E, generations. DNA. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. He was perfect in his bloodlines. He was perfect in his genes. And Noah walked with God. Boy, I tell you, I, that's, that's heavy. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Now, why would the Bible say uh, Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations if the sons of God were not fallen angels? Duh! All right, verse 12. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh... For all flesh, for all flesh had corrupted his way. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Yeah, they intermarried with the fallen angels. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and thou shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. What's pitch? Tar. You ever heard of the La Brea tar pits in California? Uh, remember Jed Clampett, the Beverly Hillbillies? He's shot, uh, shooting for some food, and up through the ground some comes some bubbling crude. Texas tea, black gold, oil people, right? Boy, if you remember that show when it came out, you're old, like me. Verse 15, And this is the fashion which thou shalt make of it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits. You know what a cubit is? Uh, it's approximately 18 inches, or about half, uh, half a meter. So that's about 150 meters. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's about uh, 300 cubits. That's about 150 feet, or about 70 uh, meters. The breadth of it, 50 cubits, and the height of it, 30 cubits. So the height is about uh, 15 meters. I'm or, well, yeah, I'm, it's late. It's late, people. Yeah, figure it out. A meter is about, you know, it's about, a cubit is about half a meter or about 18 inches. Approximately the tip uh, a cubit was approximately from the elbow to the tip of the index finger on an average man. Verse 16. Uh, for those of you that don't know it, next time you hear somebody scoff and say, ah, well, they put all those animals on Noah's Ark. Uh, just so you know, this Ark was about the size of a, an escort aircraft carrier of the United States during World War II, also called a Jeep carrier. They had two air types of aircraft carriers generally in World War II uh, in the United States. They had the escort carriers, which were smaller and slower, which were mostly for escort duties for convoys. They would provide air cover, search for uh, enemy fleets, search for submarines, search for enemy aircraft for um, cargo ships you know cargo ships were not made for speed they were made for carrying large loads they were by nature slow and then you had the what was called the fleet carriers they were fast they were made to be warships um, and they were fast they were a lot faster than the uh, escort carriers but this was the size of a small aircraft carrier. And, um, 
you know, they didn't have to carry full-size animals. They could have carried babies. You know, everybody scoffs. Oh, so they had T-Rexes and um, all those uh, brontosauruses and, you know, all this other stuff. Well, they could have had babies, you know. They didn't have to have full-size thing elephants and stuff, you know. Everybody makes a joke about that, but uh, they won't be joking when they look into the lake of fire, you know. Uh, verse 16, a window shalt thou make to the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above, and the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof, with lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. So there were three stories to this thing, right? 17. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh. All right. So if it was a local flood, why not just move? You know, just move. Go, you know, move. To destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven... To destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, okay? And everything that is in the earth shall die. Doesn't sound local to me. But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife, and thy sons' wives with thee. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark, uh, two, at least two of everything. Unclean animals, there were two. Clean animals, there was seven. Because those were what was they used for food and for animal sacrifice. So they were in sevens. Didn't know that, huh? Yeah, because if you had two cows and you killed one, oh, wow. Well, what, what, what are we going to do for food here, you know? Well, you could have killed the steer and then, you know, the cow could have been pregnant. I don't know. What do I know? Uh, and of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female. Unless you go to, unless you go to uh, uh, a liberal university, now they're male, female, she-male, He-male, uh, Z-male, B-male, uh, D-male, I don't know. 72 different genders. Thank you, Mr. Cohen, Mr. Silverstein, and Mr. Rosenberg. Or is it Goldberg? Silver, I don't know. Something like that. And thou shalt take unto thee of all food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be for food for thee and for them. Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him. So did he. Chapter 7. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for, for thee have I uh, seen righteous before thee in this, uh, in this generation. Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, by sevens, the male and his female, by sevens. And of beasts that are not clean, by two, the male and his female. Of fowls also of the air, by sevens, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth, forty days and forty nights, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. Doesn't sound like a local flood to me. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. And Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. So Noah was 600, but then after the flood, everybody lived no more than 120 years. That's what we read in Genesis 6, right? Um, and Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. And Noah went in, and his sons, and his wives, and his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood, 
of clean beasts and of beasts that are not clean and of fowls and of everything that creepeth upon the earth. You know, if there was no worldwide flood, the ark would have no purpose. Let's face it. There went in two and two unto Noah into the ark, the male and the female, as God hath commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. In the six hundred year of Noah's life, in the second month, the seventeenth day of the month, the same day were all the fountains, listen to this, were all the fountains of the great deep broken up. Do you know there's underground rivers? Yeah. And the windows of heaven were opened. If there was a canopy of water above the earth that collapsed, um, you know, that would uh, change the weather pattern quite quickly. Uh, seriously, there were deer, like I say, swimming across the river in Siberia, and they were frozen with only their heads above the, the water. A herd. I mean, they jumped in the water, started swimming across the stream, and then all of a sudden they froze. Now, some people say that perhaps a, uh, a frozen comet of water vapor hit the earth. I don't know. I wasn't there, you know. I'm only 60-something years old, but uh, that's possible, too. Uh, so the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened and the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. You know, there was a time in Florida, uh, when I was working, going to college, working two jobs, going to college. That was my white privilege. Um, and, um, I think I went on like two or three dates the whole year. The um, it rained for like twenty or twenty-one days. It, I, like three, it was three weeks. All day, all night, I got up in the middle of the night to use, you know, get use uh, use get some water from the kitchen, or use the facilities, you know, the toilet, whatever. It was raining. Went to work. It was raining. At work, it was raining. Got off work, it was raining. Went to school, it was raining. Got out of school, it was raining. Rain, 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 rain. I mean, we had we had people calling into work. I can't get to work because the cars were, you know, the engines were getting flooded out and the distributor caps were full of water. Uh, that was before you had electronic ignitions. It was horrible. I had a truck. And I had a hard time going to work. Yeah. Horrible. I can't imagine it raining 40 days and 40 nights. I mean, it, I don't think it quit for five minutes uh, any one day. It just rained and rained and rained and rained. Did I mention it rained? Yeah. In the selfsame day uh, entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah and the, Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark, they and every beast after his kind, and all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and every fowl after his kind, every bird of every sort. And they went in, into the, uh, unto Noah into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. And they went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. And the Lord shut him in. The, you know, the, the Lord shut him in. The Lord's hand closed that door. When the door, when the Lord's uh, hand closes the door, you ain't going to open it. And the flood was 40 days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bare up the ark, and it was lift up above the earth. And it was lift up above the earth. And the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark went up upon the face of the waters, and the waters prevailed prevailed exceedingly upon the earth and all and all and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered 
and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. Fifteen cubits upward. Um, so that would be about seven or eight, um, I'm sorry, yeah, seven or eight meters. So that would be at least 21 feet. At least 21 feet. I don't think any of the giants, uh, well, most of the giants were 9 to 12 foot tall. Uh, I've heard of some that were actually around 18, 20 foot. So, how long could that giant swim? 40 days? I don't think so. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. And all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of all and of beast and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth and every man. All in whose nostrils was the breath of life of all that was in the dry land died. All in whose nostrils was the breath of life of all that was in the dry land died. If it was a local flood, that wouldn't make any sense. And every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of, of the ground, both man and cattle and creeping things and the fowl of the heaven, and they were destroyed from the earth, and Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. And Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed upon the earth an hundred and fifty days. You know, why would it say, And Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark, if it was a local flood? You know, I, I just don't see it, people. You know, uh, somebody wants to believe a local flood, that's fine. You know, it's not an essential doctrine. Jesus didn't say, Believe on me in the local flood. Jesus didn't say, Believe on me in the flat earth you know, or the round earth, or whatever, you know. So, what can I tell you? That's just my opinion. So, I weaved a few other things in there. But the weather patterns changed dramatically after the flood. So, I don't know. Alrighty, well, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to Him. All one world, all one God, world without end. In Jesus' name, amen.